hi hi welcome back today we shall be reading the last chapter chapter 54 by the holy lake 30 years later mansarovar lake at the foot of mount kailash tibet shiva squatted on the rock that extended over the mansarovar behind him was the kailash mountain each of its four sides perfectly aligned with the four cardinal directions it stood sentinel over the great mahadev the one who had saved india from evil the long years and the tough tibetan terrain had taken its toll on his body his matted hair had greyed considerably though it was still long and wiry enough to be tied in a traditional bun with beads his body honed with regular exercise and yoga was still taut and muscular but the skin had wrinkled and lost its tone his neel kant the blue throat had not lost color at all over the years but it didn't feel cold any more not since the day he had been hit by the neutron blast from the pashupati astra that had destroyed devagiri the area between his brows didn't burn or throb either perhaps also due to the neutron blast but it had taken on a dark hue almost black that contrasted sharply with his fair skin it wasn't an indistinct intermediate mark either it looked like the tattoo of an eye an eye with the lids shut kali had named it shiva's third eye which stood vertical on his forehead between his natural eyes shiva looked across the lake at the setting sun in the distance he spotted a pair of swans gliding over the shimmering waters it appeared to shiva as if the birds beheld the sight together the setting sun cannot be enjoyed unless shared with the one you love he breathed deeply and picked up a pebble when he was young he could throw one such that it skipped off the surface of the lake his record had been 17 bounces he flung the pebble but he failed it sank immediately into the lake with a plop i miss you not a day passed in his life without his mind dwelling on his wife he wiped a tear from his eye before turning back to look at the bonfires outside his village compound a large crowd had gathered around the fires eating drinking and making merry some members of his guna tribe had followed him when he had returned to kailash mountain many years ago in addition nearly 10000 people from across india had decided to leave their homes and migrate to the homeland of their mahadev chief amongst them were nandi brahaspati tara parshuram and ayurvedi the deposed ayodhyan ruler dilipa who was still alive thanks to ayurvedi's medicine former michael othal governor chinardwaj and former naga prime minister karkotak had also migrated to the shores of the mansarovar shiva's followers had established new villages in close proximity to his seeing the massive contingent shiva now commanded even the pakratis the local tibetans who had maintained a long standing enmity with the gunas has made peace with the nilkant the fires reminded shiva of one of the worst days of his life the day he had destroyed devagiri sati had been cremated on the same day later on the evening but shiva did not have memories of that event he had been unconscious having been battered by the neutron blast of the pashupati astra he had been fighting for his life under ayurvedi's care what he knew about sadi's cremation was from what kali ganesh and kartik had told him he had been told that a calm breeze had blown across the land picking up the ashes from the ruins of devagiri and scattering them around slowly it was almost as if the ashes were trying to reach the waters of the saraswati to give some closure to the souls of the departed hazy specks had colored the entire landscape around the saraswati to a pale shade of gray the sandalwood pyre lit by both ganesh and kartik had taken some time to lit but once it did 
It had raged like an inferno. It seemed as if even Lord Agni, the god of fire, needed some coaxing to consume the body of the former princess of Meluha. But once the task had begun, it must have been so painful for Lord Agni that he wanted to finish it as soon as possible. Shiva had regained consciousness three days later to find an anxiety-filled gathering of Kali, Shiva and Karthik sitting next to him. After he had regained his strength, a tearful Ganesh had handed him an urn containing Sati's ashes. A few drops of water splashed on Shiva, perhaps from a fish swimming vigorously below. They pulled him back from the thirty-year-old memory to the present. Shiva tarried for some time, allowing his gaze to dwell on the lake waters. As always, he could have sworn that he saw Sati's ashes swirling in it. Of course it was a mirage. Her ashes had been immersed in the holy Saraswati. A day after Shiva had regained consciousness. He remembered struggling weakly onto the boat thirty years ago, helped by Ganesh and Karthik. The Nilkant had been rowed to the middle of the river, but Kali and he had jointly scattered some of Sati's ashes into the water. Shiva had refused to immerse all of it, regardless of what tradition held. He needed to keep some portion of Sati for himself. Indians believe that the body is a temporary gift from Mother Earth. She lends it to a living being so that one's soul has an instrument with which to carry out its karma. Once the soul's karma is done, the body must be returned in a pure form so that the Mother Earth may use it for another purpose. The ashes represented a human body that has been purified by the great purifier of them all, Lord Agni, the God of Fire. By immersing the ashes into holy waters, the body is offered back with respect to Mother Earth. He recalled the Brahmins in an adjacent boat, chanting Sanskrit hymns throughout the ceremony. One specific chant from the Isha Vaishya Upanishad had caught Shiva's attention and had been committed to memory. Vayur Anilam Amritam Athidam Bhashmantam Shariram Let this temporary body be burned to ashes, but the breath of life belongs elsewhere. May it find its way back to the immortal breath. My Lord! shouted Nandi loudly. Shiva turned to see Nandi standing at a distance. Two hooks where his arms used to be. My lord, everyone is waiting, said Nandi, keeping his voice loud enough to reach his ears. Shiva held his hand up, signalling for Nandi to wait. He needed some more time with his memories. They had sent Nandi to recall him as they knew that he had become Shiva's favourite. He had fought bravely alongside Sati thirty years ago, losing both his hands in his doomed attempt to save Shiva's wife. Shiva glanced beyond Nandi and saw Maharishi Vrigu sitting away from the others, talking to Ganesh and Karthik. The sage seemed to be explaining something from a palm leaf book. Both his sons listened attentively. Chandraketu, the king of Branga and Matali, the king of Vaishali, were also listening intently to Maharishi Vrigu. He looked back towards the lake and took another deep breath. Karthik saved my honor. Karthik had chosen the moment wisely to tell Shiva how he had saved the Devagiri scientists who had the knowledge of the Somras. The Nilkant had received the news with equanimity. Shiva was also happy that Vrigu had been saved as the great Maharishi had had no role to play in Sati's death. Furthermore, the India of the future would be the proud inheritor of the legacy of his immense knowledge. Shiva had decreed that the Somra scientists be given lands in central Tibet, far beyond the expanse of Indian empires, in fact, beyond the reach of any empire. The Somra scientists had established their home with the help of Suryavanshi and Chandravanshi troops. These survivors named their new dwelling place after their original city, Devagiri, the abode of the gods. 
this new city established in Tibet was given a name with the same meaning, albeit in the local Tibetan language, Lasha. The knowledge of the Somras, the elixir of immortality, was to be the sacred secret of the citizens of Lasha till such a time as India needed that knowledge again. Shiva had also decreed that his two sons would set up the tribe that would protect Lasha. The tribe that Ganesh and Karthik established was drawn from an eclectic mix of Chandravanshis, Suryavanshis and Nagas. They had also inducted most of the Gunas, Shiva's tribesmen and many other local Tibetan tribes. Virbhadra, Shiva's friend and loyal follower, was appointed chief of this tribe. He was given the title of Lama, the Tibetan word for Guru or Master. The people of Lasha and the followers of the Lama which protect India's ancient knowledge. Their sworn duty was to rise up and save India whenever it faced the onslaught of evil again. The Somras waste dump site that had been set up in Tibet on the Sangpo River was dug out and its contents were removed. This waste was taken farther north into an inhospitable, remote and mostly uninhabited part of the Tibetan plateau. It was buried there, deep into the ground, enclosed within sludgy cases made of wet clay and bilva leaves, which were further encased within boxes of thick lead. These boxes had been buried deep under vast quantities of earth, snow and permafrost. It was hoped that this poison would remain undisturbed forever. Fortunately, there would be no new toxic waste to be taken care of since the manufacturing of Somras had stopped with the destruction of Devagiri. Shiva had also realized that just removing the knowledge of the Somras was not enough to stop the drink of the gods. If it had to be wiped out from India, its very foundation needed uprooting. In that sense, the idea that Parshuram had at once sound. Without the Saraswati, the Somras couldn't be manufactured. Furthermore, the river's present course was picking up radioactive waste at Devagiri and poisoning the lands farther downstream. The Saraswati emerged from the confluence of Satlaj and Yamuna. If these two tributaries were separated, the Saraswati water itself would not be available for the manufacture of the Somras or for picking up radioactive waste. Shiva had decided that in the interest of India, the Satlaj and the Yamuna would part company forever. It was decreed that the Yamuna's course would be changed once again, back to the temporary course that it had taken more than a century before the destruction of Devagiri, when it had merged into the Ganga. But this was easier said than done. If the course of a river as mighty as Yamuna was suddenly changed, the resultant flooding would cause havoc. The change had to be controlled. Bhagirath, with the help of Meluhan engineers, had come up with a brilliant plan. The sides of the Yamuna were dug up and giant sluish gates were built along them. These gates, serving as locks, would be opened slowly to guide the Yamuna onto its new course in a deliberate and controlled manner over many months. Bhagirath had named these sluish gates the locks of Shiva. The Yamuna was thus slowly diverted onto its new course to unite it with the Ganga at Prayag. The locks of Shiva had thereby allowed the Ganga to take its new form gradually without the chaos of an uncontrolled flood. The addition of the massive Yamuna, along with the already worthy presence of the enormous Brahmaputra, had enhanced the mighty Ganga into the biggest river system in India. It also came to be believed that the Yamuna carried the soul of the Saraswati into the Ganga, thus transforming it into the holiest river in India. In a sense, the devotion associated with the hallowed river Saraswati had been transferred onto the Ganga. Furthermore, the burst of fresh clean water from the Yamuna had cleansed the poisonous waters in Branga, freeing the great rivers in that land of the Somras poison. The Brangas living at Ganga Sagar, the place where the resurgent Ganga met the sea, began to believe in a legend over time that the Ganga had purified their land. It was a myth that was not far from the truth. 
Meluha, without the centralizing presence of Devagiri, had devolved into its different provinces which became independent kingdoms. Without the incompetent rule of Daksha and with the fresh breath of freedom, there had been a burst of creativity, an efflorescence of varied but equally beautiful cultures. Shiva heard a loud laugh, which he knew could belong only to Bhagirath. He turned and looked at him, standing near a bonfire, talking animatedly to Gopal and Kali. Dilipa had been deposed by his army before the destruction of Devagiri. He was succeeded by Bhagirath, who had ruled Ayodhya wisely, heralding a new era of peace and prosperity. Judging by the expansion on Dilipa's face as he stood close to Bhagirath, the former emperor seemed to have made peace with his fate. Shiva turned his attention to the tall, lanky figure speaking with Bhagirath and Kali. The great Vasudev perhaps sensed that somebody was looking at him. He turned to look at Shiva, smiled, folded his hands into a namaste and bowed low. Shiva returned Gopal's greeting with a formal namaste. Gopal had made his peace with Shiva. The outcome at Devagiri was certainly not what the Vasudev chief had desired, but what had given him peace was the realization that evil had been removed and the knowledge of the Somras saved. India had rejuvenated itself as the malevolent effects of evil were removed. The Nilkant had succeeded in his mission, and in that lay the success of the Vasudevs. Gopal had also established formal relations with Virbhadra and the citizens of Lhasa, the new tribe of the Mahadev. The Vasudevs and the Lhasans would maintain their watch over India in tandem, ensuring that this divine land continued to prosper and grow with balance. Seeing his friend Gopal also reminded Shiva of the Vayuputras. They had never forgiven Shiva for having used the Pashupati Astra. It had been a source of particular embarrassment for the Mitra since he had personally backed the announcement of Shiva as the Nilkant against some virulent opposition. The punishment for the unauthorized use of a Daivi Astra was a 14-year exile. As a form of atonement for breaking his word to them and for having been the cause of death of his mother-in-law Virini and his friends Parvateshwar and Anandamai, Shiva had punished himself with exile from India not just for 14 years, but for the entire duration of his remaining life. Baba? Shiva hadn't noticed Ganesh, Kartik and Kali sneak up on him. Yes, Ganesh. Baba, it's the feast of the night of the Mahadev, said Ganesh, and the Mahadev needs to be a part of the celebration instead of brooding next to the lake. Shiva nodded slowly. His neck had begun to hurt a bit, the perils of old age. Help me up, said Shiva as he made an effort to rise. Karthik and Ganesh immediately leaned forward, helping their father to his feet. Ganesh, you get fatter every time I see you. Ganesh laughed heartily. He had suffered intensely and taken a long time to recover from his mother's death but had ultimately reconciled himself with that loss, choosing to learn from her life instead. He had taken it upon himself to spread the word of Shiva and Sati throughout India. That sense of purpose in his life had helped him return to his calm state of being. In fact, he was even jovial at times. Thanks to your wisdom, peace prevails all over India, Baba, said Ganesh. There are no more wars, no conflicts, so I do very little physical activity and eat a lot. Ultimately, the way I see it, it's your fault that I'm getting fatter." Kali and Karthik laughed loudly. Shiva nodded faintly, his eyes not losing their seriousness. "'You should smile sometimes, Baba,' said Karthik. "'It will make us happy.' Shiva stared at Karthik. It had been a long time since Sati's death, and even young Karthik was now beginning to acquire a smattering of white hair. Shiva knew that Karthik had travelled a very long distance to come to Kailash. After most of Shiva's task had been completed, 
and he had decided to return to Kailash Matsarovar. Karthik had migrated to the south of the Narmada, going deep into the ancient heartland of India, the land of Lord Manu. History has recorded that Lord Manu was a prince of the Pandya dynasty. This dynasty had ruled the prehistoric land of Sangam Tamil. The nation and its fine Sangam culture had been destroyed as sea levels had risen with the end of the last ice age. Karthik had discovered that many people continued to live in this ancient Indian fatherland, breaking Lord Manu's law that banned people from travelling south of the Narmada. Karthik had established a new Sangam culture on the banks of the southernmost major river of India, the Kaveri. I will smile when the three of you will reveal your secret, said Shiva. What secret? asked Karthik. You know what I'm talking about. Shiva did discover in due course that on the night before the destruction of Devagiri, Kali, Parshuram and Virbhadra had kidnapped Vidun Mali. Under pain of vicious torture, Vidun Mali had revealed the names of Sati's assassins. He had then been tormented with a brutal and slow death. A few years after the destruction of Devagiri, Kali, Ganesh, Karthik, Parshuram and Virbhadra had slipped out of India. Nobody really knew where they had disappeared. They had consistently refused to tell Shiva, perhaps because he had prohibited any further reprisals for Sati's death. But Shiva had his suspicions. Those suspicions were not unfounded because around the same time, rumours had arisen in Egypt about the near-complete destruction of the secretive tribe of Athen. It was said that the death of each of the tribe's leaders had been long, slow and painful, their blood-curdling screams echoing through the hearts of their followers. What Kali and the rest didn't know was that a few months earlier, Shut had exiled himself. He had gone south to the source of the Nile River and had spent the rest of his years bemoaning the fact that he had been unable to complete his holy duty of executing the final kill. But the magnificence of Sati had been branded upon his soul. He didn't know her name. So he worshipped her as a nameless god till his last days. His descendants continued the tradition. The few remaining survivors of the tribe of Aten would have to wait for centuries before a revolutionary pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, reformed and reviewed the cult. The pharaoh would be remembered as the great Akhenaten, the living spirit of Aten. But that is another story. Baba, we had gone to. Kali placed her hand on Karthik's lips. There's nothing to reveal, Shiva, except that the food is extremely delicious. You need to eat, so follow me. Shiva shook his head. You still haven't lost your regalers. Kali didn't have a kingdom anymore. Within a few years of her return from Egypt, she had renounced her throne and supported the election of Suparna as the new queen of the Nagas. Leaving her kingdom in capable hands, Kali, accompanied by Shiva, Ganesh and Karthik, had toured the land of India. The family of the Nilkant had established 51 Shakti temples across the length and breadth of the country. Kali had also convinced Shiva to part with the portion of Sati's ashes that he had kept for himself. She had told him that Sati belonged to the whole of India and not just to Shiva. Therefore, small portions of Sati's ashes were consecrated at each of these 51 temples so that Indians would forever remember their great goddess, Lady Sati. Kali had finally settled down in northeastern Branga, close to the Kamakha temple, and devoted her life to prayer. Her spiritual presence had made the Kamakha temple one of the foremost Shakti temples in India. Many Suryavanshis, Chandravanshis and Naga, who were inspired by the Naga queen, had followed her to her new abode. Over time, they set up their own individual kingdoms. The Suryavanshis had named their kingdom Tripura, the land of the three cities after the three platforms of their destroyed capital. The Chandravanshis, worshippers of the seventh Vishnu, Lord Ram, had called their land Manipur, 
the land of the jewel. For the seventh Vishnu was, no doubt, a crown jewel of India. Many of Kali's Naga followers established their own empire farther to the east. All of these different people followed the path of Kali, proud warriors forged from the womb of Mother India. Therefore, if treated with respect, these people would be your greatest strength. If you disrespected them, then no power on earth would be able to save you. I may not have a kingdom anymore, Shiva, said Kali, her eyes dancing with mirth. But I will always be a queen. Ganesh and Karthik smiled broadly. Shiva just stared at Kali's face, a splitting image of Sati's. It reminded him of how happy his life had once been. Come, let's go eat, said Shiva. As the family of the Mahadev walked back towards the bonfires, Ganesh and Karthik started speaking to Shiva about the brilliant composition that Vrigu had just shown them. It would be known over the millennia as the greatest classic on the ancient science of astrology, the Vrigu Samhita. Over the subsequent years, Shiva became increasingly ascetic. He began spending many days, even months, in isolation within the claustrophobic confines of mountain caves, performing severe penance. The only one allowed to meet him at such times was Nandi. Legends emerged that the only way to reach Shiva's ears was through Nandi. Shiva also devoted long hours to the study of yoga. The knowledge that he developed helped create a powerful tool for finding physical, mental and spiritual peace through unity with the Divine. Shiva also added many fresh thoughts and philosophies to the immense body of ancient Indian knowledge and wisdom. Many of his ideas were captured in the holy scriptures of the Vedas, Upanishads and the Puranas, benefiting humanity for millennia. Notwithstanding the prodigious productivity of Shiva's mind, his heart never really found happiness ever again. Legend has it that despite repeated attempts by his family, nobody ever saw Shiva smile again after the terrible day in Devagiri. Nobody saw his ethereal dances or heard his soulful singing and music again. Shiva had given up everything that offered even a remote possibility of bringing him happiness. But legends also hold that Shiva did smile once, just once. Only a moment before he had to leave his mortal body, once again, with the god whom he had emerged from. He smiled, for he knew that the love of his life, his sati, was just one last breath away. Karthik's wisdom and courage ensured that the Sangam culture in South India continued to flourish and its power spread far and wide. While Karthik continued to be adored in northern India, especially in Kashi where he was born, his influence in southern India was beyond compare. He is remembered to this day as the warrior god, the one who can solve any problem and defeat any enemy. Meanwhile, the adoration of Karthik's elder brother, the wise and kind-hearted Ganesh, grew to astronomical heights in India. People revered him as a living god. A belief spread throughout the country that he should be the first god to be worshipped in all ceremonies, before all others. It was held that worshipping Ganesh would remove all obstacles from one's path. Thus he came to be known as the god of auspicious beginnings. His profound intellect also led to him gradually becoming the god of writers. Thus his name acquired immense significance for authors, poets and other troubled souls. The Somras had had an especially strong effect on Ganesh, so he lived for centuries beyond all his contemporaries. And Ganesh did not mind this. He loved interacting with people from across India, helping them, guiding them. But there did come a time when, enfeebled by old age, Ganesh began to think that perhaps he had lived in this mortal body for too long. For he would have to suffer the mortification of seeing the ancient Vedic Indians torn on each other in a catastrophic civil war. A minor dispute within a dysfunctional royal family 
escalated into a mighty conflict which sucked in all the great powers of the day. The calamitous bloodletting in that war destroyed not just all the powerful empires of the time, but also the way of life of the ancient Vedic Indians. What was left behind was utter devastation. From these ruins, as is its wont, civilization did rise again. But this new culture had lost too much. They knew only snippets of the greatness of their ancestors. The descendants were in many ways unworthy. These descendants beheld gods in what were great men of the past, for they believed that such great men couldn't possibly have existed in reality. The descendants saw magic in what was brilliant science, for their limited intellect could not understand that great knowledge. These descendants retained only rituals of what were deep philosophies, for it took courage and confidence to ask questions. These descendants divined myths in what was really history, for true memories were forgotten in chaos, as vast arrays of Daivi Astras used in the Great War ravaged the land. The war destroyed almost everything. It took centuries for India to regain its old cultural vigour and intellectual depth. When the recreated history of the Great War was written, built through fragments of surviving information, the treatise was initially called Jaya, or victory. But even the unsophisticated minds of the descendants soon realized that this name was inappropriate. The dreadful war did not bring victory to anyone. Every single person who fought that war lost the war. In fact, the whole of India lost. Today, we know the inherited tale of that war as one of the world's greatest epics, the Mahabharat. If the Lord Nilkant allows it, the unadulterated story of that terrible war should also be told one day. Om Namah Shivai The universe bows to Lord Shiva. I bow to Lord Shiva. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have read Shiva Trilogy for all of you.